It's going to be a good day today at City Church. And hey, before we jump into the message, can we put our hands together for our online community that watch every week? Faithful. It's better in person. So you get an opportunity to come join us. How many of you would agree it's better in person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Week number three of our series, Kingdom Logic, I hope it's been challenging you and uh, stretching you and growing you, because at the end of the day, let me just say this, man, you need to be growing. If you're not growing, you're dying. Come on, somebody. And so Kingdom Logic is about discipleship. It's important. Come on, some of you don't look so sure, but it, it is, because there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is what? Come on, help me out. Thank you for the three biblical scholars here, we're going to get into that, by the way. That's in the message, you know. So, um, yeah, man, there's a way that seems right. When we talk about logic or logical thinking, it's the act of analyzing a circumstance or a situation and coming up with a sensible solution. The problem is, is you people don't have any sense. <laughs> Come on, tell your neighbor, Pastor's already talking about you this morning. <laughs> you know what you do need? You need a biblical solution. Come on, you need kingdom logic. Biblical solutions work. They produce. And I want to help you with that this week. If you'll let me shout amen, if you will. Yeah, Acts chapter 28, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. One of the favorite stories. Uh, Acts chapter 28. Let me catch you up. In Acts 27, Paul has, uh, he has uh, he's on trial. He's uh, appealed to Caesar. He's on his way to, to Rome for uh, preaching the gospel. How many of you know he's being persecuted in prison? We get our feelings hurt when somebody don't agree with us online on social media, and we're like, oh, we're being persecuted. No, stop that. And they just disagree with you. Uh, and so Paul is on a ship, and he's headed to, to Rome, but he endures a storm, a bad storm, he gets through the storm just to get to the, the part where the ship breaks apart, pieces and planks, and finds himself in the sea swimming. How many of you know that's not very good? Uh, he makes it to shore, and, and we'll pick up in Acts uh, chapter 28 because Paul is going through one of those type of seasons and moments in his life. And if it's on the screen and you got your phone open and your Bible open and you're ready to receive, say, go with it, Pastor. Now, when they had escaped, man, that's a heck of a season that you escape. When they had escaped and then they found out that the island was called Malta and the natives showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was fallen and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his and they said to one another, there ain't no doubt this man's a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up and suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time, how many of you realize consistency matters? Come on, I'll say that again. Consistency matters. And so when they looked at him a long time and they saw there was no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. Look at your neighbor this morning and tell them to handle the hurt. Come on, say it mean mugging like you got a little bit of hood in you. You know, some of you here at City Church, we're, we're a little bit hood and a lot of holy. Come on, somebody. Handle, handle, the, handle the, the hurt. Can we talk about it for a little bit? Shout amen if we can. Amen. Yeah, how many of you have ever been in one of those types of seasons uh, where things go from bad to worse. Like we just admit by the show of hands, you've been in seasons where it just, I mean, we make up sayings to communicate those types of seasons. We say things like when it rains, it, yeah. Or we, you know, where I come from, we say things like out of the frying pan and into the yeah, y'all are with me today. First service wasn't, but you guys are the holy anointed crowd that drag into church late because you were up too late last night. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah, we communicate seasons in our life where it seems like, man, it just can't get any worse. But how many of you know it, it does? 
And Paul's in one of those seasons. He's on, he, he's on a journey to Rome. He's been made a prisoner. He is being shipped. He has to go through this storm. The storm is it's called uh, a, a, a Yerkeladondon or something like that. I don't know. And it's, it's a hard word to pronounce, but any hard word to pronounce to name a storm is a bad storm. Yerkeladondon, that's it. I'm from Buckville. Get off my back. Yerkeladondon. I got it right the first service. Yerkeladondon just sounds like a bad storm, man. 14 days. 14 days, they didn't see the light of, of day. The sun, it was blocked. I mean, raging, storm, seas. 14 days, they fasted, they prayed, they didn't eat. They thought they were going to die. An angel of the Lord appeared. That's a bad storm. But Paul could at least say, well, I know the, bad, the storm is bad, guys, but we at least got the ship. Everybody thankful for the ship, and then the ship falls apart. It begins to run ground. Breaks off into pieces and planks, and all of a sudden, the storm went to a, a battered, broken ship to swimming in the sea. How many of you know that's bad? It gets from bad to worse. And I could just see Paul. Paul, he's like, if I could just make it to shore. Gets up on shore only to be snake bit. At this point, it's like Paul probably just, have you ever had one of those seasons where you can't believe, like can't believe that something like that happened? It's like, really? A snake? And you laugh, but you really want to cry. And you laugh, you're like, ah. <laughs> from bad to worse. Seasons. And Paul's having one of those types of seasons. One of those types of, of moments. And he finds himself in a place called Malta. And how many of you realize Malta is not on the, even on the manifesto? Like, that's not even a part of the plan. We're going to Rome, not Malta. What is Malta? Malta was not a part of Paul's plans. But let me just say this. Many are the plans of man, but God's purpose will prevail. And just because it wasn't a part of Paul's plan doesn't mean it wasn't a part of God's purpose. Come on, somebody. And wherever God has placed you, there is purpose for you in that place. I don't care where you're working. There is purpose for you in that place. I don't like where you live. You may have not have planned it, but there is purpose in that place. And there is purpose on Malta, even though Paul did not plan it. But, you know, ministry in Malta is a lot different. It's a lot different than in Jerusalem because see, in Paul's ministry, he would often persuade and he would find a synagogue and persuade the people concerning the law of Moses and the prophets. How many of you know that word native for Malta, the term, like naming the natives means barbarian. And this is what I've realized is that ministry in Malta has to be different than ministry in Jerusalem. Because you know what ain't on Malta? A synagogue. Come on. And Paul would go to, to synagogues and he would reason and present his, his case for Christ concerning Scripture, concerning that Jesus was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. He was brutally murdered. He was raised to life. He could go and he could have a foundation from the launching point of Scripture and faith when he was in Jerusalem, when he was in Corinth, where there was synagogues. But how many of you realize ministry in Malta is much different? Because in Malta, they don't read their Bibles, they read Paul. Come on, somebody. This is after, after they watched a long time how he reacted, how he responded. Because this is the reality, is that Malta is more like 21st century America than what you realize. Come on, I know that we, we, we called the Bible belt, but let me just say this, we're losing our belt. Because people aren't reading their Bible. We don't have the foundation of scripture and the like when my grandparents were were my age and in their 30s how many of you know that it was commonplace to know scripture to have a foundation of faith they knew they knew what salvation was they knew what sin was they knew what righteousness was and unrighteousness they knew right wrong good evil boy girl
21st century America can't even get boy, girl right, much less righteous, unrighteous. We call good evil and evil good, right, wrong, and wrong, right. And 21st century America is much more like Malta than what you could ever imagine. That's why it's important, come on somebody, how we react, how we respond, how we walk in love, how we extend grace, how we extend mercy, how we parent, what we post, it matters because they ain't reading their Bible today, they reading you. And how you react. Come on, that Malta, Malta, the barbarians, I mean, I just imagine whenever they landed on shore and they had that fire going, they're probably like, what y'all cooking, people? Come on, y'all seen the movie, right? Be like, look at the appetizers swimming to shore. <laughs> I don't know. The first service didn't get it. I'm cutting out today. But really, ministry in Malta is different. Ministry in America, 21st century, is different. Because people today don't have the scriptural understanding as generations in the past. And so Paul couldn't come and, and persuade through his superior scripture knowledge of pointing to the law of Moses, pointing to, pro, to the prophets. And so the reality is, is that they watched Paul and how he would react and respond. And when he responded and reacted to the hurt and to the pain in a way that was uncommon and unusual, that began the transformative moment in someone else's life. And discipleship is important. How you react, how you respond, how you parent, what you post. People aren't reading their Bibles today. They're reading you. And how we extend grace and how we extend mercy and how we extend kindness and how we parent and how we, has a major impact on 21st century America, because they're just like Malta, there's no scriptural foundation. They don't know what's sin, that's salvation, a savior, righteous, unrighteous. They do what seems right, but the end thereof is, come on, help me out. Yeah. And so Paul's going through this season and he swims on shore. And uh, Paul's a leader, not just because he wrote the epistles, but, you know, true leaders, man, they like, they, they serve. And so all Paul's doing is he's gathering sticks to put on the fire to provide a service for other people. But in the process of helping, how many of you know Paul got hurt? Have you ever got just hurt by just helping? Come on, somebody. Yeah, all, all, they, all they would do, all Paul was doing, all you were doing, all we were doing, we just trying to help. And in my helping, I got hurt. I was just warming up to the idea of church again. And then I got bit and I got hurt just trying to help. I was just warming up to the idea of serving again, but I got bit and it got and it hurt. And I was just trying to help. I was just warming up to the idea of joining a small group. But the last time I tried to help, I got bit and I got hurt. So I don't help anymore because I got hurt. Just warming up to the idea of, of dating again. But last time I tried to help, I got hurt. And because I got hurt trying to help, I'm no longer helping anymore because I don't want to don't want to help. Hurts to help. Paul's helping. And a cotton tooth rattle moccasin <laughs> comes out and fastens himself. Paul's hand. He was just trying to, just trying to help. And got hurt. This is what I know about hurt. <laughs> Sound effects and all. I didn't charge it because it would be moving and all that. This is what I know about hurt. Hurt will hang on to you. You think time heals, and time doesn't heal. That's why some of you are dealing with the same vibe 10, 20, 30 years ago. Time don't heal. Jesus does. Oh, that's good. You've been deceived. No, you still. And the, the issue with the bite is the bite hangs on. How long have you been hanging on to your hurt? Or let me just say this. How long has hurt been hanging on to you? 
And I'm not trying to make light of the bite because after all, this ain't no garden snake. This ain't no black racer. It's a viper. That ain't that what the text says? I mean, this is a, a, a viper like we've never even seen. Cotton tooth rattle moccasin, man. I'm telling you. Dangerous. But you realize that the point of the snake isn't just to harm the hand. See, some of us, we celebrate victimhood. We go around showing everybody our snake. Going to everybody showing everybody our wound. And listen, I'm not trying to diminish and make light of the bite because it's a viper and it hurt and it, it did some damage. But the goal of the viper isn't to cause harm to the hand. It's to put poison in the heart. And the problem is, is when we talk about victimhood, come on, you bring your snake, you bring your hurt, you bring your harm into every season with you. So the snake bit you and you just bite everyone around you. So now you deal with the poison that was injected in you. The bite is what happened to you. But let me just say this. What happened in you is much worse. Sometimes we're unaware. We want to tell everybody, look what a cotton tube rattle box did with my hand. And you're rude. Come on. What do they read in Malta? And if you're carrying your snake into every season with you. That's why you get the same result. Different marriage, same result, same snake. <laughs> different jobs, same result, same snake. Come on, different day, same result, same snake. Because you bring you and your bite and your snake and your hurt into every season. I'm not trying to make light of the bite. It hurt. But can I tell you that the goal of the viper is not to harm the hand. Come on, it's to stop the heart. And just because it happened to me does not mean it has to happen in me. Well, that sounds good, pastor, from the pulpit. But what does that look like? What does that look like practically? What what does that look like? Because this is what I know in the human condition that you will be bit. Not because I said so, but because Jesus said so in John 16, 33. He said, look. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have what? Peace. And in this world you will have what? Tribulation. You'll get bit. But be of good cheer. See, the bite is inevitable, right? It's inevitable. But how I respond bitter is a choice. I can go through trials, but I can be of good cheer. I can't help but to go through trials, but I can help how I react and how I respond and how I navigate life. I can't, I can't help some things, but I can, I can control how I respond to it. I can be bit, but my choice to be bitter is a choice. And some of you are bitter and it's a choice because if you can choose to have cheer in the midst of trials and tribulations, I can choose to be better in spite of my bite. That was good. That was Dr. Seuss anointing right there. I felt that. Don't make me. Handling snakes today. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you how to break the snake. I'm going to teach you because this is what I know is that the goal of the viper is not just to cause harm to your hand. It's to take what's in it. Can I tell you the enemy wants to take what's in it and inject it in you? So how how do we do that? How does that look practically for for you and I, how, how, do we, how do we bump up against offense but not take offense? Because isn't that what Jesus teaches us? He said this in Matthew 10. He was talking to his disciples. He was sending them out. And he's, he said, listen, listen, whoever will not receive you or hear your words when you depart from that house or city, just shake, shake the dust off your feet. So what are you trying to say, pastor? We just... That's how we deal with it. Magically delicious. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. It's the way my brain works. Stop it. My wife's like, why? <laughs> what, what's, what's, what's he saying? Is he concerned about the, the dust? Like, we get, 
some of you, like, you got to take your shoes off before you come into my house, right? Or what, what are you concerned about? You're concerned about tracking every place that you've been into where you're going. And that's what, Jesus ain't concerned about the dust on your shoes, but he is concerned about the offense and the rejection and the hurt and the harm that's on your life, taking it into another season. Because you're just going to get the same results. Because time doesn't heal, Jesus does. Shit, like, because we don't, we, we, go, we go through some things, but there's some things that we got we to gotta leave in our past. We got to leave at the door. It's like when we went to New York, I, the first thing we did when we got home after walking 27,000 miles, <laughs> torture, we can make it. <laughs> we, took, we, took, we took a shower. Now you come down, it's like you've been in, I don't know, man, just Subway and you got everything, like all this, like you... We get to the room and it's like, we're taking showers. Everybody taking, we're taking showers, get, get clean. And so as, cause I, I, the, the ladies take a shower first. I, I just went and laid down in Grace's bed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, them teenagers are, come on, they're dirty anyway. <laughs> like, <laughs> she ain't in here, I can talk about it. <laughs> My wife did come in. It's like, get up off that bed. I was like, oh. I was like, but it's, it's graces. Well, what, what's she saying? Listen, same thing that Jesus is saying. Don't you bring it in. And that's what Paul, Paul did. Paul, after a while, and he did not react, and he did not respond to the hurt and the harm. Could it be, man, how we react and how we respond to hurt and harm in our lives could be the transformative tool that God uses in the lives of the barbaric, like the people around you watching to see if you would swell up with pride and swell up with anger and swell up with these things. Because let me just say this, there's never been a time that our nation has been so angry. And the reality is, is anger is a secondary emotion Anger is hurt's bodyguard. So anytime you see somebody really, really angry, they're really, really hurt. I don't care what facade they're trying to put on. And so I want to help you do what Paul did. Paul shake, he, he, he shook that thing off. Shake it off. Somebody say, shake it off. Man, that sounds good up here, right? Almost sounds like that two-a-days football coach. I should blow the whistle. Shake it off. Suck it up, buttercup. Rub some dirt on it. Water's for the week. <laughs> I got them all. <laughs> what does that look like? Like, honestly, what does that practically look like? And I've, I've got an illustration that, that I want to use this morning that helps us to visualize the importance of discipleship. And it's, a, it's an illustration a pastor used probably six, seven years ago. I'm using it in a different way. The Lord brought it to my remembrance, and I thought, wow, this would be a really good way to show the importance of discipleship and how we guard our hearts, right? Isn't that what Proverbs say? It says in, in chapter 4, verse 23, guard your heart above all else for the issues of life, flow th through it, determines it. Come on, can we give it up for our crew right there? Yeah. <laughs> Drum roll, please. So how, how, do we, how, do we guard, how do we guard our heart? How do we shake it off? Because these things sound really good, inspirational from the pulpit, from the platform, but how do we make it impactful and powerful for our, our life? How, how, how does that work, pastor, shaking it off? Well, I'll give you a few things that's gonna help you shake it off. Ready? Say, I'm ready, pastor. How about you pray first instead of post first? Because when we post about our hurt, about our anger, how many of you know people are just looking for an opportunity to be mad at a bite that they didn't even receive? It's amazing. 
I wonder what our life, I wonder what our soul would look like if we prayed as much as we posted. Come on, and when we post anger, post hurt, we become a vessel that spreads the poison because remember the point of the viper, the point of the enemy, and just to harm the hand, it's to stop the heart. And if we're gonna guard our heart, if we're gonna shake it off, can I tell you, you're gonna have to go to prayer first, bring it to the one that can help you with the pain, that can help you with the wound, that can help you with the area that is suffering. And too many of us, we wanna get on social media and we wanna post our hurt and our harm and we become vessels that spread poison to people that are looking to be offended. It's not gonna do any good. Prayer. Just talk it and bring it to the Lord. And I'm not, listen to me, I'm not trying to minimize the bite, but I am trying to get you to recognize that there is freedom and that there is healing from Christ for every situation that you've been through. The second thing is that when we go to the, to the word, how many of you realize Jesus said this concerning, concerning the heart? Whoever who believes in me, man, that out of the, what the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay? Well, Paul says in Ephesians, he uses the water for the word to wash and to present the bride spotless and blameless. And so whenever, listen to me, whenever we allow the word to come in, come on, it brings healing. It brings deliverance. It isn't just a matter of you reading your Bible just to get that in, to mark that off the checklist. Let me just say this. Each one of these ping pongs represents a bite. Come on, we've, how many of us have been bitten? We've all been bitten. You cannot escape this human experience without getting bit, bitten. In this life, you will have tribulations. You will have trouble. You will have heartache. You will have, you will, you'll be bitten. And it starts at a young age. Maybe you're on the playground, man, and you know that little girl doesn't like you, and you get rejected. Never had that happen before. No, just kidding. <laughs> or your, your friend, you know, and this broken system and every, like the human experience is usually one bite after another bite after another bite. And so now I try to deal with the pain and I got addictions and insecurities come by. Why? Because I'm getting bit. I'm constantly getting bit at, from a young age to my teenage years. Why does I'm, I'm not attractive. I'm, I'm not worth anything. My parents don't love me. And so there's bite after bite after bite that begins to fill our vessel. And remember the point of the viper isn't to harm the hand. It's to stop the heart. And so we get wounded. It's rejections. It's insecurities. It's never good enough. Maybe it's physical abuse, sexual abuse. And we get bit after, we get bite after bite after bite after bite until, until we've, we're a vessel that's full of poison and full of heartache and full of shortcomings and full of insecurities and, and full of abuse. And, and the, the enemy just keeps biting us and biting us. And we keep showing people our snake in our hand and our harm, but we fail to recognize it didn't just happen to me. It happened in me. And so the goal of the viper, the cotton tooth rattle moccasin, is to take what's in it and get it in you. And so when we go to the, oh, no, I don't need to do that. All right, there we go. So we go to the word, which is like water out of the heart and will be rivers of living water. And so we begin to pour the word into our heart. And see, this is where a lot of people stop. You know what we say? It didn't work. Because we live in a microwave, instant gratification culture. It's not the king's way of doing things. That's culture's way of doing things. And so we want instant results. And because we come a month or two months, and we still are dealing with the same issue, same ping pong. We quit. It didn't work. Oh, if I had some alcohol up here, I'd start trying to 
pour it all around because that's what we trust me. That's what we do. We try to medic. We try to deal with all the bites, all the wounds, all the poison, all the hurts, all the harms, all the failures, rejections, the insecurities. But how how how, how long did they look at Paul? How long did the barbarians, the natives, look at Paul? A long time. Like you know, long. When you know you're from the south, when you say long. And so consistency, and as you pour the word in, oh, what's happening? Oh, yeah, the word's dealing with a lot of that poison, a lot of that attitude, oh, a lot of rejection. Uh, Come on, we begin to pour the word in. So you're trying to get the ping pong balls out. God's saying, I'll deal with that if you just get what's in me and you. Can I just pause right here? Because this is where a lot of us stop because we've got a little bit of results and we think, oh, I, I, I ease disease. I got this. The problem with that is, remember who watches Paul in Malta? The barbarians, the people that are, are constantly looking because Paul's the only Bible that they'll read. You're the only Bible that 21st century American reads. And the problem with stopping like this, because we've dealt with a little bit of issue, a little bit of struggle. This is why your Christian walk is so important to have consistency in the word and prayer. Come on and in worship, because a lot of us stop here. And so those close to me, right? Look, look right here, right here. Pay attention. Those close to me, they can see see the Jesus in me. The problem is, is the people far from God, all they see is all the poison that's in you because you won't stay committed to discipleship. Because 21st century America does not read their Bible, they read you. But when we stay committed to this journey of faith, that I'm going to know God, I'm going to find freedom, I'm going to make a difference. Come on, somebody. I'm going to discover my purpose. And as I stay committed and faithful to the word of God, it begins to evict these wounds, these hurts, these pains, these failures. And you get in a good small group because you always need a hand with some things. relationships. You're over here trying to deal with all the ping pong balls in your life. And what I'm telling you, if you just pour the word in, it begins to evict some of these things out. I can talk about effortless change because I put my effort in pouring the word and the water in my life and it drives out and evicts those things that the enemy put in. You think it's just about reading your Bible. No, it's so that 21st century America can read you when they read the Bible. If it ain't challenging you and pruning you and cutting things out and driving things out of you, then you've just committed to a a religious ceremony. There's no power in it. But when you allow the word of God, this is how you guard your heart. This is how you guard your heart. This is how you shake it off. And are bites going to come again? Absolutely. But where are they going to (laughs) fall? I couldn't have planned it any better. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) It isn't that you're not going to have them, but your heart is so filled with God's word. Whenever the enemy bites you, his spirit, his love, his mercy, his grace, his compassion just begin to flood out of your life. It begins to flood into other people's lives. It becomes the transformative tool that God uses to reveal Jesus through you. Kingdom logic. And how about worship? Dedicated to worship. It takes my focus off of my pain and puts it on his presence. And when I focus on his presence, I think about his pain that he endured for me. And it begins to transform my life and heal me and deliver me so that when people bump up to me, they don't get the poison. They get the presence and the fragrance of Christ. They can experience love. It isn't that I didn't get bit in the hand. I just made a choice not to let it go to my heart. Because I'm submitted and committed to discipleship. And watch what Paul does. How he reacted and how he responded gave him an opportunity to reveal the healing nature of Christ. To reveal Christ in a powerful way. Because Publius, his father was sick. Dysentery from Oregon Trail. Some of my 80s babies. (laughs) 
He lay sick of fit fever and dysentery. Paul went to him, don't miss this, and prayed and laid his, somebody say hands. So not only did Paul shake it off, he was willing to stretch it out. And the very hands probably still had the cotton tooth rattle box and mark on it. He stretched it out and the very place that he was bitten became the very place God used to bring a blessing. You're never more like Jesus when you take that wounded area, that hurt area, and you stretch it out to God and he uses it to help heal others. I know you've heard, I know you've heard, we're going to get out of here. I know you've heard hurt people hurt people and wounded people wounded people. But how about this? How about healed people can heal people? And we're never more like Jesus when we take our wounds. We take that place that we were hurt because we were willing to shake it off. We were willing to commit to the word. We were willing to commit to prayer. We we're willing to commit to worship. That healed he laid hands. The same, that's, that's, that's the mark of discipleship. Can I take a bite and still be a blessing? Can I endure harm on my hand but still be able to heal with my heart? Because we are never more like Jesus whenever we take those broken, bitten places and use it to bless others don't believe me look at Isaiah 53 and we'll end with this and we'll pray and get out of here he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquity the punishment that was brought us peace was on him and by his say it with me we are how do we go be Jesus to someone man I just showed you some of you this week you're going to be the only Bible that someone reads. And how you react and how you respond to hurt, to pain, to letdown, to bad seasons, to storms, to shipwrecks, relationship wrecks. Letting your bite be a blessing. Not letting that thing that attacked you attach to you. be the very thing God uses to reveal Jesus in a powerful, personal, and impactful way in our community. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that through your power and through your love and through your word, God, that we can guard our hearts, that we can be so full of your spirit, your grace, your love, your mercy, your kindness, that, Lord, when we're bit, we don't bite back. We don't return evil for evil. We don't post, but we pray. God, we don't worry, but we go to the word. And God, we learn to worship you, realizing that through the cross, God, that you endured horrific pain so that we could be healed. God, help us in this moment to see discipleship as the catalyst and as the vehicle that other people can see how we live, how we love, that they can see that even in the midst of trials and tribulation, that we choose to be cheerful, grateful, and thankful. God, we honor you and we love you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. hey, can we put our hands together for Jesus?